Okay. All right, gentlemen, so let's go ahead and get started here. Um, this is this was a homework I assigned you last week, and we will I will quiz you sometime later in the class when hopefully the rest of the men are able to join. But let's begin with a word of prayer, and then we'll get back into our study of the book of James. We're thankful, Father, for your continued instruction to us by your spirit through your word. We're thankful, Father, that your word is living and and uh, active and alive in our lives lord uh, it is updated to our time in which we live and even <clears throat> this wonderful book of james this practical book of james that we're studying uh, this uh, semester is so helpful to to guide us and to show us how to live and how we face things in life so lord we pray your blessings upon this time we pray for the other men who are uh, either trying to sign on or have uh, perhaps forgotten about the class uh, or traveling to get to their their prospective place, that, Lord, you would watch over them and bring them on to class as well as we continue and bless these men who have already joined on. May it be a helpful time to them and to uh, all of us, we pray, for your honor and glory. And bless my Ability to teach, keep my voice strong, help me be able to communicate clearly your precious word. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, gentlemen, let's continue our study. So we'll come back to this uh, in a little bit. Let's see how we're doing here. But let's move on to uh, to well. Let me let me do a little bit of review, just to do a little review. Make sure we're all on the same page because I got some new, more information. So we're studying the Book of James. Talk about this. Introduce this. Uh, this course will have an emphasis on Bible study and looking at a uh, especially a book study. So we're looking at one short epistle in the New Testament, uh, the Book of James, one of the twenty-seven books of the New Testament. We're, we're I've chosen it for a couple of reasons. One is because it's short, and we're able to do a book study of it in, in one uh, one class. Uh, also, I'm doing it because we're learning the aspect of doing verse by verse and how the verses and the paragraphs and all fit together. So we're really emphasizing a a biblical theology study uh, this this week. And so there's no textbook in the Bible. Uh, my goal is for you, if you're, and I'm, I teach this class primarily to those of us who are preachers and teachers. So uh, my goal for you is to learn how to actually study, prepare and study um, a book of the Bible in order to uh, prepare to teach if you're in a classroom setting or a college setting or seminary setting or to preach if you're in a, in a church setting. And uh, I preached through the book of James twice in two different churches where I've been in. Uh, went through it uh, just recently about a year ago. And I've also taught this course uh, overseas in um, China and the Philippines. And actually, I've taught in India as well. So I've taught this in, in various places. So yeah, I love this book. And, and most believers I know love this book, too, because it's so practical and helpful. This is one of the epistles uh, given to us by inspiration of God's Spirit, and uh, it has a and, and it's a letter. An epistle is a letter written uh, like a personal letter written to a group of people or to a particular person. Some letters are written to a particular person, like Philemon is written to a to a man named Philemon. Uh, First and Second Timothy are written to primarily the Timothy. But they're meant also to, especially when God's hand is upon them, it's written to be a much broader audience after the initial audience of the person or the church. The good church, at, um, the, the epistle of um, Ephesians, the epistle of Colossians, these are written to specific churches, but designed to be shared with other churches and Christians as well. And so, but letters have a purpose, usually one major purpose. And I'm kind of I've already kind of let the let you know what I believe the major purpose is, and it's because pretty much agreed upon by most uh, biblical scholars. It also has a uh, letter also have structure, just like you may be writing to someone, you have a, a certain message you want to communicate to them, you also have a certain structure you often follow. 
And so a, a formal letter like this or a business letter or an inspired letter from of God's word will be like this. And so that's that basis. We talked about the author. Uh, someone was asking about the name James. I could not find a specific meaning of name James, but it is the uh, transliteration and uh, and if you would translation of the Greek name Jacob. So Jacob in the Old Testament, Jacob in Hebrew is somewhat equivalent to um, James in the New Testament or in Greek. We talk about the four the four Jameses we find really in the New Testament, and James, by the way, was a somewhat common name. So there's four Jameses we find in the Old uh, New Testament, and um, I believe, and most people believe, that it was James who uh, was the half-brother of Jesus. In other words, they, Mary was their mother to Jesus and James. But, uh, of course, the, Jesus had no earthly father, whereas James had Joseph as his father. James, because of his humility, um, identified himself not as, uh, hey, I'm Jesus' half-brother, listen to me, but he, he identified himself as a servant of Jesus Christ. He really didn't seem to be a follower of, of Jesus, the Messiah, during Jesus' life for the most part, but somewhere near the end of Jesus' life, um, at least after the crucifixion, resurrection, perhaps before, we're not exactly sure, but sometimes James come to trust Christ, uh, not just his older brother, but also the Son of God as his Savior. And so we see reference to that, so did, by the way, Jude which is another one of the half-brothers of Jesus, a full brother of James, but a half-brother of Jesus, who God used to write the book of Jude. We don't know as much about Jude as we do about James. but So, the, so I'm, we're pretty confident that James was the writer, was the author that God used. Um, probably sometime before 50 AD. There's a couple of reasons why we talked about last time. One was the fact the earthquake, the, the huge major earthquake that did such destruction in Israel. I think it was 49 AD. There's no mention of that. Uh, other writings, almost all the writings of that period would have mentioned that uh, or mentioned that in the folks who lived in Israel because it was so catastrophic and so much destruction. Um, there's no mention of, of Gentile Christians much. In here is written primarily to the to the Jewish Christian or written to this book to the Jewish Christians. James was a pastor and leader of the church there in Jerusalem, pastor of the church of Jerusalem, and uh, he was recognized that we looked at last week some. And he says in verse one of this book that it's written to the Jewish Christians who have been dispersed, and that dispersion for the most part, and that's the idea of the word scatter abroad, in verse one. Uh, the dispersion, for the most part, is a reference to actually the time, I and mean, that's a formal word you find in history, time where persecution really broke out, like in Acts chapter 8, and you see another wave of it in chapter 11, but where persecution really broke out against Christians, and even against Jews, but against Christians primarily by the Jewish people oh, yeah. and by the Romans, it and they down, they went everywhere down. preaching the gospel. Like and then we talk about the theme of spiritual so maturity like to the like test it. of our faith. So that, that's, I think that's about as far as we got last week. Um, oh, I did show this a little bit more called pastor of the church. Tradition says he was a man of prayer because of the, his knees were so hard as a camel's. And this is what is written about James and also even Josephus, the Jewish historian who basically uh, became a traitor to his people and became a Roman satirian and went along with the Romans. Uh, Josephus, uh, this Jewish historian, um, wrote so much about, about um, the church and about traditions and about uh, some about Jesus, not a whole lot about Jesus, but you know, they, he wrote uh, these things down. And according to Josephus and other tradition, uh, around AD 62, uh, James was yeah. murdered, cast down, and clubbed to death there in the temple by the Jewish, uh, the Jewish fanatics, the Jewish uh, religious people. 
So that kind of brings us up to date to where we were. And I gave you this assignment to read through the book of James seven times. We will, um, how are we doing as far as, how are we doing um, as far as participants? We've got 12 of 12 here. So we need some more yet. So we're going to continue to proceed along. Is that okay, Dr. Victor? We will continue to proceed along then. Okay. So we're going to, so the theme, I believe, of this book, the whole book as a whole, um, has a theme, and most books do this. And as you read it over and over again, and I've read through the book of James seven times this past week as I request as I uh, assigned you, but I have probably read the book of James a hundred times or more in my life. And uh, I don't know exactly how many I haven't kept track of that, but probably a hundred times easily. Um, and taught through it, as I mentioned, probably a dozen times in different countries in Asia, preached through it in my own church twice. But the test of your faith, I think, is the is the um, it, it would encapsulate the theme of the book. And, and, and most, like I said, most books, especially epistles like this, will have a major theme uh, that's carried out. So, that, so uh, these, so the test of your faith is about considered the theme. Let me move this out of the way. Okay, it's test your faith. And I put these Jews to whom James is writing were professing Christians. They were followers of the Messiah, of the Christ, because James calls them brethren 15 times in this book. So one reason I have you read all of it, another reason why I have you read the book over and over and over and over again is because as you do that, if you're reading it, think thoughtfully, you're seeing the same words showing up over and over again. We're going to talk about a few of those words today as we introduce the book still. But th these Jews that James is writing to, as he talks, says here in James chapter 1, verse 1, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, to the 12 tribes, which is a reference, obviously, to the Jewish people, um, which are scattered abroad, greeting, and then he, the verse 2 says, my brethren. And so you see him using this, is reference we, today we would say brothers and sisters but my brethren so that would encompass both and he uses in these five short chapters the word brethren in other words directing his attention to brothers 15 times it's like if i were with you today preaching i would say now brothers or i would say no no um brothers and sisters and i do that sometimes when, I'm, when i know i'm uh, teaching to christians so james james's audience um, were professing Christians uh, from the Jewish background, because that's primarily all most of the people who were there in the in the early church, um, according to the book of Acts, the first eight chapters, they're primarily Christians, religious leaders, common people, but uh, not Christians, Jewish people who came to Christ as their savior. And that was their common bond they had. So he calls them brethren. And at least 15 times that takes place uh, in this book. And then, because of his relationship to these Christians from a Jewish background, and remember, he was he was a, a religious leader. He was a leader of the church. He was uh, the pastor of the church, or, or one of the pastors. Many believe he was actually the primary pastor, the senior pastor of the church of Jerusalem. James, in five short chapters, makes uh, gives approximately sixty commands. And what I mean by that is actually, as he's writing here, he uses the imperatives, Greek imperatives, approximately 60 times. <clears throat> that is something that shows the unique uh, relationship he has. These, these Jewish Christians he's writing to respected him. They saw him as a father in the faith. They saw him as a, as a godly leader. And so in five short chapters, he can make 60 commands. That, and so in other words, about 12 commands a chapter. That is very unusual to see that, that strong of commands, not just suggestions, not just instruction, but actually do this, do this, don't do this, stop doing that, keep doing this. Those kind of commands is what James is doing over and over again, six, almost 60 times in five short chapters, almost 12 times, an average of 12 times a chapter. That is that is very strong on commands compared to many of the other New Testament books. The Apostle Paul was a man who gave commands, but not to this extent. 
So this showed this showed James's relationship, I believe. I mean, when I stand up when I stand up on a Sunday and preach to my church people, I I I would be more um, because I'm their pastor. I would be more apt to make commands, say you need to do this and you need to do that on the authority of Scripture, because I have a relationship with them. They know my people know. My church people know as their shepherd that I'm going to give them God's word and I'm going to tell them what God's word says and, and let them know by making these commands. I'm also saying these commands are upon me, but they're for you as well. Whereas as I'm teaching you men today, I will not I would make as many commands because we're still establishing a relationship Um and and you're and to some of you this is the first time i've taught you to others i've taught you on several occasions and even at different locations so we have different relationships there but but james had a strong relationship with these jewish christians he could tell them basically god says do this you need to do this oh, by the way you're doing this stop and he could do that because of that relationship he has yeah. so that's very unique about this book and those five short chapters to see him making approximately 60 commands. And then we're talking about the idea of tests. Tests, once again, in uh, verse two, and we'll get, we're gonna get more into this in, in our introduction, uh, all these verses in a minute, but we're just really introducing these words. But here in verse two, it says, my brethren, so he's talking to Christians, Count it all joy, and this word count is one of those commands. That's the first command we find there in this book, where the command is, you count it all joy. And what do they count all joy? When they fall into diverse temptations. And this word temptations uh, is introducing to us uh, what I believe is the major theme of this book. It's introducing to this word, Greek word. I have it transliterated for you there. Um, this Greek word that refers back to tests or testing, trying, uh, some similar root meanings here or root words here. And uh, translated into King James and other, other translations may translate it differently, but King's translating King James, temptations and temptations, because oftentimes tests can become temptations uh, or become temptations. We'll talk about that in just a few minutes also. But this word tests is a word that was used not just in the Bible, but outside the Bible, this Greek word. And it deals with a design. It's designed to evaluate the quality of something, uh, to test different materials. And for instance, I have someone gave me some metal. Military man, a friend of mine gave me some metal. And I'm not sure what kind of metal this is. Um, but a piece of metal that he gave me actually was from some shrapnel because he was in the war. He was over in the, in the Persian Gulf and he brought this back and a type of metal that came off of some type of missile or rocket or something like that. And he just and I work with military sometimes, minister to them, preach to them. And so he gave that to me. Now, what kind of metal is it? I don't know, but it can be tested to find not just what type of metal it is, but also the quality of the metal. Uh, steel, which you use in your buildings in, in the big cities there in India, those of you who are in the Delhi area, a lot of those buildings are made from steel. And steel must be tested to make sure it's strong enough and has the, has the, the ability to not be brittle, uh, but to be strong enough to to build all that weight upon it so they can build a multi, you know, multi stories, dozens of stories on top of it. Metals are tested to see their quality. It's the, the tests are not designed to, you know, make them feel bad about themselves or not designed to make them fall, designed to find their strength and make sure they're strong enough to endure the, the building upon. And once again, I'll get to, I'll get to that in a minute, but tests the christian tests tests of our faith are designed to for us to be able to see because god already knows the answer to that question but to, for us to be able to see how strong our faith is and whether our faith is strong enough to for us to grow and be stretched 
or whether we have some weaknesses in our faith. And, and so uh, tests have a way of revealing that as you go through different tests of life, um, like the metals that are tested or currency, another thing. Uh, currency is also tested. Currency, well, I mean, currency, I mean like money, whether it be bills or coins. And I know you have both in your country. I've used both. I have both um, in your country, from your country. Um, but when you're talking about the, the dollar bill or the bill itself, or whether you're talking about the coinage that goes with that, uh, they both are tested, especially a long time ago. Um, not as much today because it's pretty standardized. But still today, people uh, in America, and I'm sure in India, will counterfeit um, paper currency. They will they will make it on on copiers. They will print it on color copiers to try to make people think it's real and exchange it. You know, exchange this fake dollar or fake one hundred dollar bill or fake money of yours uh, to for people to think it's real so they can get away with nothing um, without paying anything for it. And of course, that's illegal. And there's ways of testing that in, in the U.S. dollar. There's ways they do that. There's actually in the U.S., I'm not sure in India they have this. In the U.S., there's actually a pen that a lot of uh, store clerks use. You can mark it across, um, mark it across a, a currency, one of the U.S. currencies. And if it's, and if it's um, real, apparently that, that mark disappears. But if it's fake, that mark stays. And, and they can do that. They have these pins designed to do that, among other things. Um, it, it, it's a test to design, to design to see whether the money is real or counterfeit. And tests to our Christian life sometimes can do that as well. Uh, there are, um, sadly, but this is not a surprise to any of you who've been in the ministry for any length of time, there are some pastors even out there. There are some teachers out there who act like they're very spiritual who act like they're very godly men. And, uh, and, and if you would just hear them speak on a Sunday morning, you would think they're very godly and very close to God. But when they go through tests, they fail terribly because their faith is not strong in the Lord. And they fail terribly. And God is using that by his grace, those tests, in order to reveal their flaws so they can be corrected, confessed, and forsaken if it's a sin, or worked on if it's just a, a weakness area. But God does that because he knows for us to be able to lead others, and for us, for people to be able to build their lives upon our preaching and ministries, that we need to be strong ourselves. Uh, and tests also work in a classroom. You know, when when we teach our students, we frequently give them tests. And why do we do tests? Because we want to punish them and make their life miserable? Well, of course not. Um, I've given a lot of tests in, in India, in a lot of seminaries and Bible colleges and so forth. And uh, sometimes not just testing Bible content. Down south, I was involved with, a, with one of the, the professors there about helping even teach ideas of English grammar and uh, stylistic uh, ways of, of, of uh, writing and answering essays and even critical thinking questions, not just, you know, not just A, B, or C, but critical thinking questions. And so uh, that's designed to test us. Tests are designed to test our academic or knowledge, but also our abilities. And on and on it goes. My wife is a trained teacher. And for years, when we lived in Virginia, another part of the United States, she tested students to see where they were academically. And the test would take place once a year. And these tests, achievement tests, some of them were called, were designed to see if a child is up to his grade level, whether he's understanding what every eight-year-old or every 10-year-old or every 16-year-old should know uh, by this place in school. And there are test designs, standardized tests designed to do that, that shows their weaknesses or shows their strengths and so forth. So tests are used all through our lives, but God is the one who designed tests initially. 
to evaluate the quality of something. Um, he either designed them or he permits them. They have the same result. They show quality um, of our walk with the Lord. Now, as I've entitled this, if you see this, I put test of your faith, pass or fail. You know, God, God doesn't test us to see whether we have an A faith or a B faith or a C faith. You know, it's really whether or not our faith, it's whether or not our faith is, is able to, whether our faith is strong enough to pass this test. And if not, God graciously and often puts us back in the, the, the learning uh, what do you want to call it? The schoolhouse again, the place of learning again. Uh, another test will come to help us to learn these things, um, learn these truths or learn these promises to grow our faith uh, so that eventually in the Christian life, we stop failing and we begin passing the test. And so uh, it's a test of faith and, and, and really it's a pass or fail. And over this course, this uh, this semester, <clears throat> we're going to look at, I'm going to be teaching you at least about 12 tests of our faith that we find right here in the book of James. And we'll be going through them week by week. Um, some weeks will take both hours to go through a test. Some weeks we might be able to do two tests. Um, but anyway, we'll be going, because they do vary as you go through the book. They're not all equal as far as the amount of material that James gives to them. And he knows why, by God's spirit, why some, some tests take 10 verses to deal with, and some tests take two verses to deal with. Uh, some one verse, uh, one test later on in the book takes one verse to deal with that test of our faith. But we're going to go through these tests because God's designed this, these tests, in order to strengthen us, in order make us stronger in our christian walk and even in for those of us in ministry which many of you are for us in our ministry to others and so when we talk about tests and uh the, a lot i mean well every week because the theme is tests of your faith and how a christian reacts or responds to this testing this trying indicates really whether it's a test or a temptation the same trial, maybe that's another word we can use, the same trial of our faith can either become a test to show us our weaknesses or can become a temptation to sin. That's not because God's tempting us. That's because we responded or reacted wrong. Let me give you one of many examples, a ministry, a ministry example. We're trying to minister to a church or pastoring a church, and someone comes to us and says says something like, uh, I don't like the way you talk about this certain subject. I think you should stop doing it. I think it's wrong for you to do that. Well, I mean, there's really two ways we can respond to a test like that. Uh, one way is to say, well, brother, um, God's word teaches on this, and therefore I am going to teach it because it's the right thing to do, because God says I'm going to preach the whole counsel of God. Or we could respond, that's a passing way, or we could respond with two other ways we could fail this, this trial that becomes a temptation to us. One way is we could blow up and explode in anger and say, how dare you tell me what to preach and what not to preach? Who do you think you are? We can talk them down and really, in a sense of anger and pride, fail the test. Or we also, or the other side of filling the test is to say, yes, you're right. I, I will not preach on this. When I get to this part of scripture, I'm just going to skip right over it. That's not, that's failing the test also. Because we're not told that we can pick and choose what we want to preach in God's word. We're told by, by Paul himself or by God himself through Paul that we are to preach the whole counsel of God. And some parts of God's words, it's much more a blessing to preach. And some parts of God's words, it's very difficult to preach. But we are to preach the whole counsel of God. And so even in something like that, there's a trial of our faith and of our obedience and of our ministry in that way. But it's not, but the same, let me use the word, because there's Greek word here. Let me use the word neutral. This Greek word here is neutral. 
It doesn't always mean inclination to evil. That's the definition of temptation. It doesn't always mean a trial to make us stronger. That's a test of our faith. Um, it, it's a neutral word. The, the difference between whether it's a test or a temptation deals with our response to this neutral word as we're exposed to that in life. Okay, I hope that's clear. And then I'm, then I, thirdly, I'm bringing out this past fail idea. God both directly tests us by the way, never to do evil, but God directly tests us, and more, and in prior ways, even more often and more common, uh, indirectly, God permits the testing of us. Okay, and we're tested by many different outside sources, um, and some of those tests are toward evil, not by God, but by Satan. But as we find out later in this first chapter, oftentimes the test, the trial comes simply from our own flesh that tempts us to do what's wrong. And um, so the, that's one of the, the God, but God permits it. We're going to talk about that whole overview. We're still doing this overview of testing right now, but God permits it. Why? For his, for our good to make us stronger because when we're tempted to do its evil, tempted to sin. And we say, no, I'm going to obey God. No, I'm not going to get involved with, with that woman. No, I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to look at that, that um, pornographic material on, on the computer. No, I'm not going to take money from the offering. It does not belong to me. Whatever the, te whatever the temptation might be that our flesh struggles with us about. When we say no to those things, what does that do? That strengthens our past. We pass that test of our faith, and we become stronger. Because I can tell you, man, from experience, when you say no to the temptation, when you say no, as hard as that is, doing what's right and pleasing God, the next time, it often is easier for you to say no. Because you get yourself in the habit, I'm going to please God, not man. I'm going to please God, not my flesh. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to obey God and do what's right, even if everyone else I know is doing what's wrong. And you're passing those tests, and it becomes easier over time when you consistently pass the test of your faith. So the God both directly tests and indirectly permits, God indirectly permits the testing of his children for our good, but also for his glory. Because he's glorified when we do what's right and when we stand up and do what's right and what pleases him. And so I'm encouraging you, as you should encourage the people under your ministries, we need to strive. And I'm using that word strive purposely. And strive implies the idea of working. It's hard. It's difficult. But it's possible. We need to strive to pass the tests of our faith and make that our goal is that we want to Whenever we're test, our faith is tested, I want to pass. Lord, how do I pass? What do I need to know about passing that, that test? And so that's kind of the theme of this, this whole book. James is encouraging these Jewish Christians that, yes, you're going to have tests your faith. And you need to work and, and purpose yourself, strive to pass these tests of your faith. And so James is encouraging them in this fashion. And so now we're going to move in, and we're going to we'll start this, and we'll take a break, a little bit of break. Um, uh, we'll take a break and come back and finish these. But what I'm giving you here, this is still overview, introduction to the book. But what I'm giving you is what I call seven biblical facts about the test of the believer's faith. And we might be able to get through these, um, at least most of these, before our break today. But here are seven biblical facts about the tests of a believer's faith. Um, because remember, only the believer can really, by God's grace, pass these tests. But the number one fact that you realize is that testing in our faith, testing in the Christian life, is a normal part of the Christian life. It's not an exception, but it's normal. Look at first, let's look at a few of these verses. First Peter chapter 4, verse 12. Let's look at these verses together. It's all these different authors. Uh, by inspiration of God's spirit, writes on testing 
because this is the common part of our normal of our Christian faith. So what are some of these facts? First Peter 4 12. Beloved, so he's talking to the Christians again, remember, because the testing of the, it's the testing of the believer's faith. Beloved, think not think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. He said, and then he goes on and says, rejoice, just like James said in James 1. Here, Peter is saying, rejoice, verse 13. But don't think it's strange that you're going to have your faith tried. Becoming a Christian does not make life easy. So, I mean, as you're witnessing people, don't say, look, you, you trust Christ, your Savior, and all your problems are gone. That's not true. The difference is, the difference in trust in Christ the Savior, now you have Christ to go through those trials with us. You have the power of God's Spirit to have victory over those trials. And you realize as a Christian that these trials are all, I don't have this down as one of these seven, but it's true. These trials are all temporary. Because it, at the very, if it's a disease or something like that, it only lasts during this life. We get a new body in heaven. And we get a uh, we get a whole body in heaven and instead of having um, continual problems uh, in, in eternity. But it is normal. Uh, and testing our faith is normal. Look at what, what uh, Paul says by inspiration in 1 Corinthians 10. 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 13. Where he says, there hath no temptation, no testing, whether it's, whatever the ends might be, there's been no testing of our faith, um, taken, no temptation has taken you, but such as is coming to man. So what he's trying to say is the trial, the testing you're going through now, is you're not the first person to go through it. Many others have gone through it. This is common to our faith, common to the, the Christian life. This is common to really all men in that way. But at least as believers, we have the we have the power of God's Spirit to have victory over these tests and pass these tests. But it's not that you're special in going through these tests. Uh, it is something that is that is indeed common to man common to believers, whatever you're going through, whatever challenges you have, whether that's an outward temptation or whether uh, or an outward test or whether that's an inward temptation in your brain or in your heart or in your flesh, it's very common. You're not going to face something in all likelihood, pretty, I can pretty much tell you, you're not going to face a trial or a temptation in your life that, that many others have not faced before you. And they found victory many of them found victory in jesus christ and you can too so testing of our faith is a normal part of the christian life why because that's what makes us stronger we don't necessarily become stronger through the calm blessing times of life we become stronger through the through the test of our faith as we go along second secondly and we already looked at verse two um seven uh seven biblical facts secondly varied they're varied um James 1 verse 2 says, count all joy when you fall into diverse trials and temptations. The word diverse means different. There are some general temptations that happen, and that's really what we're going to study in the or trials that happen. That's really what we're going to study in the book of James. He gives us basically 12 general uh, tests of our faith that, that all of us will go through at one time or another. But then there's also specific tests for you. And oftentimes they are brought on to you by your own flesh. And that's why some of you, for instance, are tested in some ways that others are not tested. Some of you struggle with um, your confidence uh, to pastor a church, whereas others other men seem so confident. That's not their area of, of trial and testing. Whereas you are realizing, I, Lord, why do you call me this? I don't, I'm not worthy to do this. And, and, uh, and that you spent a lot of time going through that. And you had to just back up the fact that God knows what he's doing. He's called you to pastor this church. So be faithful and do it. Uh, others are, are um, tempted in certain areas that others are not. Some, some men, a lot of men are tempted in the area of, 
of um, uh, morality. And it's a real struggle for them. They're battling through that and uh, what women wear, clothing women wear, and and other areas in the battles of the mind where some men don't struggle with that. They struggle with finances. And they're always feeling this desire to take something that doesn't belong to them. They always feel like, as a pastor, I'm, I'm not being paid well enough, so maybe I should take take money um, <laughs> You know, through thievery, through stealing, through embezzling. And uh, of course, both, whether it's lusting after a woman or stealing money, both of them are sins, big sins, major sins. And and whether you lust in your mind or whether you actually take money, both of them are failing the test. And he wants us to pass the test. Thirdly, is it's challenging. It's challenging tests. Another biblical fact about tests, they're challenging. Um, it says, my brother, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. This word fall, same where we find back in Luke chapter 10, where it talks about the man going, uh, the, the man who was robbed going from Jerusalem down to Jericho, um, the one to whom the a uh, good Samaritan went and helped him, Luke chapter 10, verse 30. Uh, we find that man surrounded by thieves who, though he's a Jewish man, he was surrounded by thieves who stole from him and beat him and left him half dead. And this is the same word as we find in James 1, 2. Sometimes we feel like we're going to be surrounded by tests. They don't always come one at a time. Sometimes tests kind of multiply and st on, stack on top of each other. And it's like it's just one thing after another. And, and Lord, what's going on? And God, help me through this time. And God, I'm overwhelmed and I'm failing. And sometimes that's when we grow the best is when we're able to admit it and realize that God has allowed tests to take us to our physical or human limits so that when we pass the test by God's glory, we realize it's only of God that we pass the test. It's a challenging time. We're surrounded by them. We fall into diverse temptations or we're surrounded by them. It seems like there's no escape is how we feel. So it's challenging. It's also beneficial. Going through verses 3 and 4 of James 1, it's beneficial. Knowing this, that the trying of our faith, we can know this by experience. We can know this from God's word. We can know this from other Christians who've gone through before us. We should know it through other trials we've gone through in the past in our own lives that we've, by God's grace, passed. Knowing that the trial of our faith works patience, endurance, strength. Remember, the tests are designed to, to test our strength. And as we pass these tests, it makes us stronger. Metal, steel does not become, metal and steel do not become stronger when they're tested. But we, as in the Christian walk, can become stronger as our faith is tested. Our faith becomes stronger as it's tested. It becomes more sure and grows, works patience or endurance. Uh, so, he, so he says in verse four, let patience have her perfect work that we may be perfect and entire, lacking nothing or wanting nothing. Let the test come. And as we're tested, pass each test, do what's right, obey the Lord. Don't give in to bitterness. Let God make you bitter, uh, better. And what happens is you grow in your faith. It's beneficial to you in that, in that matter. And it'll make you, it says perfect and entire. We're not, so none of us going to be perfect. We understand that. It's going to make us complete. It's going to make us mature in our faith, mature in our, in our Christian walk. It's going to make us mature. So it's designed to do this. First Peter chapter 1. If you bear with me, since we got started a little late, I think I was going to finish these before our break, so we can keep this theme going here. But First Peter chapter one, where it says in verses six and seven, "Wherefore ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through the manifold temptations, the multiple and multi-leveled um, tests that come along in life." That the trial, verse 7, that the trial of your faith be a much more precious than gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, 
I'll be found in the praise and honor and glory of the appearing of Jesus Christ. So here Peter is admitting to them, you know, sometimes these trials are something like they, they, they cause us to be heavy and burdened. And we feel like we're being overwhelmed by these, by these trials that's going on here. They, they're manifold they're from every direction. They're from even from directions we did not even think would come. But what happens that standing up under that and enduring through that and by God's grace doing what's right, what does it do? It makes our faith purified. It benefits and gets rid of the dross so that we're much more precious than gold that perisheth. Remember the, the gold, verse 7, 1 Peter 1, 7, gold, if you've ever seen this, and I've only seen this on, on documentaries, but gold is melted down and heated and boiled to very high temperatures uh, in order to remove the impurities. The yellow gold, if you've ever seen a gold bar, that yellow is a lot of impurities. Gold, as it's boiled down, impurities are removed, become more and more transparent, more and more translucent. Uh, the reference even to walking streets of gold in heaven. Um, and then there's other references that seem like the streets are like crystal. And there seems to be an aspect where there's pure gold and the purities out of the gold, but make it so make it pure gold becomes more and more transparent, translucent. Uh, so in our own lives, the the tests make us more and more pure and less and less dross, less and less extra stuff. So, so the purity in our lives. So these tests are beneficial. And then, then I say enjoyable, but they're beneficial. They're, they're permitted. Going back to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. Um, they're permitted. There's no temptation taking you, but such as is coming to man. We've already looked at that part. But then the second part says, but God is faithful, who will not suffer you, or will not per permit you to be, and that's the word permit, could be translated permitted, will not, could not, per will not permit you to be tempted above that you're able, but will, with that temptation, provide a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. See, so God knows our faith level. God knows the strength of your faith. And he is going to allow tests to come in order to stretch your faith, in order to strengthen your faith. But God knows your breaking point. And he will not, as 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, he will not allow you to be tempted and, and tested above your, what you are able to handle by his grace. And he will put a way to escape where you can be like a Joseph and, and run away from Potiphar's wife when tempted to do what's wrong. Or you can be like Job, who through all the terrible trials and unimaginable trials he went through, he still passed with flying colors. He still passed that test of his faith because God's permitted that uh, to strengthen us. Uh, tests are also, number six, revel uh, revelatory. Uh, revelatory, I'm sorry. It reveals what's really in our hearts. I mean, I've kind of alluded to that throughout that, but we actually see that reference twice. Um, two great examples. I have one in Exodus 16. We're almost done here. Exodus 16, where God is testing Israel. God has done some great things to Israel. He gave great victory and delivered them out of the, the Egyptian, out of Egypt. He took them to the Red Sea and he showed his power by opening the Red Sea and drying out the bottom of the sea uh, so they could walk across on dry ground. And then as the Egyptian armies chased them, they, God collapsed the waters on the army and basically wiped out what was then the most powerful army, the most powerful military in the world at the time of, of the Exodus. And then God brings them over to the other side of the Red Sea and they can't find water to drink. They can't find bread to eat or food to eat. And what do they do? They forget everything God's done for them, his deliverance, his protection, and they begin to murmur and complain. And, and it was revealing how shallow their faith was. Look what, he, what God says to Moses and to the people there in Exodus 16 and verses 4 and 5. 
Then said the Lord unto Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and people shall go out and gather a certain rate every day. Remember, God said that we collect enough food, uh, enough manna, just to, just for your food for the day. Don't collect food to, for tomorrow, <clears throat> or it will become full of worms. Collect just enough food for today for you and for each person in your household, and that's all. And trust me tomorrow that I will provide for you again. Now, he did say on Friday, the day before the Sabbath, I'm not going to rain bread from heaven tomorrow on, on the Sabbath. Uh, so on Friday, they could collect two days worth, and then they would eat it on Friday, and it, it would not be full of worms on Saturday on the Sabbath, so they could eat it again on Saturday. God did a special miracle there, but he was testing their obedience in doing that. And so, sure enough, some people collected more food than they should have collected uh, on a normal day of the week, and the next day, it was full of worms. And then, of course, sure enough, uh, some people only collected one day's worth on Friday, so when they woke up Saturday, there was no manna from heaven, and they were hungry all day long because they disobeyed God. Um, you know, some of the tests... Some of the tests of life haven't changed much. God still tests whether we will listen and obey his word. So it says, uh, and gather a certain rate every day that I may prove, that's the idea of testing, prove them whether they will walk in my law or no. And, in, and it shall come to pass on the sixth day, they shall prepare that which they bring in, and it shall be twice as much as they gather daily. So God, even through using the manna, said, I'm using the manna to meet your needs, provide your needs. And, and it was nourishment for them for full, almost 40 years, and it, it, full of nutrients and everything else they needed to survive for 40 years in the desert. But God said, but still, in providing the manna, there's going to be a test. And it's going to be a test of their faith and their obedience, whether they will do what I tell them to do or not. And it's something that was so, such and so simple as the manna falling from heaven. And his provision this way. Sometimes the tests are very simple, but they do reveal to us the, our obedience or our lack of obedience. Well, look over in 2 Corinthians chapter 13. Second Corinthians 13. Where now the Apostle Paul is challenging the Corinthians on this area of testing. And this is what he says. In 2 Corinthians 13, examine yourselves whether you are in the faith. Prove or test your own selves. Know you not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except you be reprobate? So he's saying, your faith, your life should show forth whether you are a believer or not. Corinthians. I mean, there are some people there who, who heard Paul preach and kind of were adapting some of Paul's teaching, but they had not become Christians and so forth. He said, examine yourselves, whether you're in the faith. If you're in the faith, you're going to be producing fruit. You're going to be passing tests. You're going to be seeing God at work in your life. And so what he's saying is that tests reveal whether we're truly saved or whether we're truly obedient or whether we're passing the tests or not. And then lastly, still in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, uh, just we'll back one chapter, tests also can be very humbling because God can't use proud people. Uh, God cannot use us if we're full of pride. And pride has been a problem since the beginning. Pride was a problem with Lucifer in heaven, got him cast out of heaven. Pride is a problem of many Christians. I was just meeting with someone yesterday about how to, how to deal with a brother and, and that we've talked to about. And really, the, the, this brother who's a preacher, his main problem is his pride. And until God humbles him or until he confesses his pride and forsakes it, he really can't be used fully like God wants him to be used, nor can you. And God's had to humble me many times in my life. And God will have to humble you. Sometimes God has to, because sometimes God humbles us through our health problems. Sometimes God humbles us through uh, financial distress. He wants us to come to Him. Paul's area was in, in health situation. 
And Paul is talking about the trial of his faith that he went through. I mean, he had been persecuted in so many ways for his faith, and uh, he had been called all types of names. They had tried to stone him to death. Uh, he had been shipwrecked, all these different things Paul went through. But this thorn in the flesh is what really humbled Paul, and this test of the thorn in the flesh. And Paul passed the test. He did not allow the, the health issue to become to make him bitter, but it made him stronger and better in Christ. So let's look at this passage before we take our break. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 through 10. And he says, unless I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations. See, Paul re received all these revelations from God through which he wrote the inspired God of God's word. Paul was also taken up into the heavens to be able to see some wondrous things, many of which he was not allowed to report to us. So these kind of revelations could make one proud. Look where I've been. Look who I look what God shows me. Uh, look how God's using me. Paul could have said all those things, but then that'd be a, be pride, pride. So he says, lest I should be proud through the abundance of these revelations. There was given unto me in the middle of verse seven, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, to beat on me, lest I should be exalted above measure, lest I should be proud. For this one thing I besought the Lord three times, that it might depart from me. And the Lord said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength, God says, is made perfect in your weakness, Paul. Most glad, Then Paul said, most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, my weaknesses, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, Paul says in verse 10, I would take pleasures in infirmities, in reproaches in necessities, in even persecutions, and in distresses for Christ's sake. But when I am, and these are all different types of tests, aren't they? Pleasure, infirmities, sicknesses, reproaches, when people turn their backs on us, necessities, going without financial provision in certain areas, persecution in which people hate us and try to kill us or hurt us, and other types of distresses, which could be a broad category, for Christ's sake. When we go through those, for when I am weak, then am I strong. Paul says, in those times of weakness is when I draw closer to you. I get closer to you. I depend upon your grace that is sufficient for me to do what you've called me to do. It's a humbling time. God uses uh, faith, uh, the test of our faith to humble us. Um, so these are seven biblical facts across primarily the New Testament, but also the Old Testament, where tests are used for our good and for his glory. Okay, I think we're going to do it. I know we're going to take a break now. So let's go ahead and take a break. I went a little long, but let's go ahead and take a break for the next uh, the next uh, eight minutes, it looks like here. We'll go until, what does that be for you? 6.15, is that correct? 6.15? Is that correct, Dr. Victor? Six, seven, it's now. Six, seven. It's 607 now. Okay, then we'll six, go until eight, no, uh, yeah, right we'll go now. into about 615. Let's go into 615. Okay. Oh okay. about eight minute break. Right. Okay. We'll be back in in eight minutes. All right. So we have most of our students here. So let's go ahead and take our quiz now. Um if you would go ahead and put your put your close your Bibles and put your your notes away that can so you won't be tempted to cheat. And I want you to write down from memory James 1 verse 2, as I assigned you last week. James 1 verse 2. It shouldn't take long because it's a short verse. So don't tempt yourself, close your Bibles. Honor system, obviously, only you and the Lord knows. But do uh, do what's right and write down from memory from the King James Version, James 1, verse 2. We'll take about a minute to do that. Question number one.
Okay, question number two. Yes or no answer. Did you read through the book of James seven times this past week? James, uh, question number two. Did you read the book of James seven times this past week? Does not have to be a one sitting. That's my preference. But did you read through it seven times? That was really the only two matters of homework I gave you. Number two, yes or no, did you read through the book of James seven times this past week? Once again, it's an honor system. Some of you will be tempted to lie. Don't lie. Be truthful. This is only a simple quiz. All right. And then question number three is, question number three is, um, are you available occasionally to start class an hour early? I have a couple of conflicts coming up that, that I have to either have a one hour class or have to start an hour early. So <clears throat> the question for you is just yes or no. Not, it's not a right or wrong answer. I'm just trying to get some feedback from you. So question number two is, uh, question number three is, are you Will you be available a couple times this semester to start the class at 4 p.m.? Yes or no? I mean, if you if you cannot do it, then please put no. Um, thankfully, we do record this, so you can always go back and watch it later. But it's a couple times where I have some schedule conflicts, and I would need to start class earlier. So yes or no? Um, uh, I can start the class. I am able to start the class at 4 p.m. occasionally. Yes or no? All right, so now I need you to put your name on this sheet of paper so that Dr. Victor can read your name and then go ahead and take a take a picture of that. Um, take a um, camera shot of that with your phone. And you can, would you prefer them to text it to you by WhatsApp or email it to you? Yes, sir. Uh, for everyone, please you send to me either email or WhatsApp, or I think WhatsApp is better through your phone to send to me. It may be convenient for you. Yep, and go ahead and do that now, um, or uh, by you know by the time we're done class. Um, yes. What can write and down? Write your name on it. Make sure your name is down. He can read your name, and then uh, remember, right from memory, James one two. Yes and or no. Question two. Yes or no. I read through the book of James seven times. And then third question: Are you able to? Are you able to um, occasionally, a couple times this semester, start class an hour earlier? That'd be a 4 p.m. your time, right? Yes. Okay. And so put your name on that and please send that to uh, Dr. Victor. And we're going to continue uh, our work through the book of James. Okay, so let's have a word of prayer. And uh, here's Dr. Jim calling me. Let me tell Dr. Jim that I'm teaching a class. Okay. All right, so let's go ahead then and uh, have a word of prayer, and then we will get into the book of James. We're actually, to this, this hour, actually begin to get into the book uh, after all our introduction. I did all this introduction the past uh, three hours here. So, Lord, please bless our time as you look into your practical book. Thank you. Lord, uh, for its its teachings and its conviction, Lord, as we now understand better the tests of our faith, help us all to choose by your grace to grow through them. 
and to become stronger through the test of our faith and to pass the test of our faith for your glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, let's continue on then. Uh, talking about the, the, um, G James had a relationship with these people. They are, they are professing believers. He calls them brothers. He gave them almost 60 commands in these five short chapters. This word uh, translated temptation or tests or trials uh, from the same basic uh, Greek root uh, is designed as a neutral thing to test the quality of something. Uh, how we respond to these this, these trials whether it is determines whether it's really a test or a temptation, and God either does it directly, or more likely it happens He permits it indirectly. In other words, He lets other things happen to us uh, to help us to grow in our faith. But remember, He provides a way to escape that we may be able to bear it. We looked at this uh, seven biblical facts. The last hour is how we ended up. And God's desire for us is to pass these tests, um, which are normal and varied and challenging and beneficial and permitted and revelatory and humbling. He wants us to pass the test and make us stronger so he can use us in greater ways for his glory. Okay, so let's now get into the book itself. And, um, and here's a little bit of an overview, and we're going to work through these first 12 chapters, uh, 12 verses, excuse me, and that's probably as far as we're going to get today. Uh, what, what I'm entitled as a as really an introduction to the book, uh, this is James's introduction. This is not one of the tests, but his introduction to the book called The Testing of the Believer's Faith is what I'm calling it, and that's really the first uh, 12 verses. So we're in our Bibles now. We're going to work through, Lord willing, um, in the next 30 minutes, uh, these first 12 verses, uh, for the most part, verse by verse, and I'm going to be filling in some gaps in each of these points, but this is just showing you how you outline and the structure that seems to really, just, as you read over and over again, as I've done this dozens and dozens of times, kind of just comes right out of the text because it was there in, in the mind of the writer through inspiration of God's spirit. So testing the believer's faith. And so verses 1 through 12, let's go ahead and read that. You can follow along as I read verses 1 to 12. Uh, I encourage you to read scripture uh, in, your, in your, um, your services as you're preaching and teaching. We want to bring people back to the word. I also involve using one of my men in my church to read the scripture just to give them experience of studying around people and doing it. I, I'm very big on training the next generation. And so uh, I do this as uh, I have them do that. I do encourage you as you read, especially like here's 12 verses. We're going to look at just the first 12 right now. 12 verses. Uh, every couple of stand, uh, verses, maybe every three or four verses, I let you know where we are. I do that for a couple of reasons. First of all, I'm just being practical with you as a pastor. Uh, first of all, sometimes people have different translations that they follow along on. Uh, from different from what you're doing. So sometimes they can get, they can lose their place if they're following along in your translation. Second of all, a lot of the people we preach to on Sundays, friends, if this is news to you, uh, they are exhausted. Hello, yes, sir. And we're glad that they're at church. We're glad they're worshiping the Lord as they should, but they're exhausted and their minds wander and they're tired. Some might even doze off and fall asleep sitting there because they're not used to sitting still, and they're sitting still in church uh, for the preaching. So I remind them where we are, okay? So let's go ahead and work through this, uh, start at James 1 in your Bibles, and I'll read out loud, and you follow along, please. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. My brethren, remember, 15 times he says that in this book, count it all joy. First time he uses that command. First of about 60 times, he gives a command. Count, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting or lacking nothing. Verse 5. If any of you lack wisdom, 
Let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let a man ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven by the wind and tossed. But let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Verse 9, let the brother of low degree rejoice in that he is exalted. But the rich man, in that he is made low, because as the flower of the grass, he shall pass away. For the sun is no sooner risen with a burning heat, but it withereth the grass, and the flower of the earth falleth, and the, and the grace of the fashion of it perisheth. So shall the rich man fall, fade away in his ways. Verse 12, blessed is the man that endureth temptation. That word trials and testings and so forth. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Okay, and we'll stop our reading there. That's that first real paragraph and introduction to this whole idea, the whole book of the testing of the believer's faith. So we'll start we're, uh, stop right there. I don't know if we'll make any further than that. If we do, we'll continue to read. Uh, if not, we'll pick this up next next week, verse 13. So let's talk about the testing of the, of the believer's faith. One let's moment. work through that. Let's, let's help our people understand. Still working. Hold on a second. I'm sorry. All right. So let's talk about the testing of the believer's faith. And this overall theme, I believe, of the whole book and introduced here in verses 1 through 12, 1 through 18, actually. That's the introduction to the book before the tests start. It begins with what our proper attitude is. You're talking to the believer because an unbeliever can't, can't pass the test. Unbeliever, they, they fail every test of their faith. Uh, even if they temporarily seem to be doing, doing okay and maybe they pass a little bit of thing, they ultimately they, they fail because they're not saved. So that's why he, over and over again, James says, my brethren, my brethren, my brethren, 15 times in this book. And he tells the brethren something that's impossible for them believers as well. In fact, it's very hard for all of us. He commands us to count it all joy, to count it joy, to, uh, to see it as joy, to, to reckon it uh, by faith, to, to, to have a joyful attitude about it. He's talking about the proper attitude to have which is not the natural attitude. My natural attitude when I'm tested is not joy, but I can have a proper attitude of joy. God, God wants me to have a proper attitude of joy because I know the whole picture. I know why the tests are coming. If we don't understand, and God tells us why, but if we don't understand the full picture that's involved there, then a time of testing can be very confusing. In fact, in the time of testing, many younger believers fail and they become bitter. And it drives them away from God. Uh, they do not find that way to escape. They try to bear it in their own flesh and they fail miserably. And that's where we have to come alongside as, as Christians, more mature Christians, or as, uh, as pastors or leaders and come alongside them and encourage them and help them through this time. It's, you know, if someone is learning to swim, I don't know if you understand this analogy. This is something we would use here in our country. If someone is learning to swim and they don't know how to swim yet, or they're just learning to swim, what's involved in swimming in a pool or swimming in an ocean, we just don't throw them in there and say, hope you make it back. No, if you're, when I've taught my children to swim, I'm there in the water with them. Now, I'm letting them try, but if I see it, they're struggling and starting to fail, I, I pull them out of the water. I don't want them to drown, but I do want them to learn, to, to go through the swimming process, to learn to do that. And, and, uh, and so I've taught my children to swim, and they first initially are starting to learn to do strokes. You know, I, I may hold them up in their, in their stomach. I might have my hand under their stomach to kind of hold them up so they're not... So first of all, they, they know they're not going to drown because their daddy is there, but also to help them have a little more confidence there that they learn to float on the water and, and to propel themselves by swimming strokes across the water. They can have that joy and that peace 
um, that we can have. And we have the same thing as believers. We know our God does not want us to drown. He, he wants us to pass the test and he's there to support us. And so uh, he also gives us spiritual leaders and pastors to help us through that time as well. So we can count all joy when you fall. Remember that word fall? I talked about the fact it's the same word we find in Luke 10. It's like I did being surrounded. And sometimes in, uh, surrounded by thieves, like the man who was robbed on the way to Jericho was surrounded by thieves who beat him and stole his money and left him in the ditch half dead. And the religious leaders passed on the other side, the priest and the Levite, but the Samaritan is the one who ministered to him. And we're, and sometimes in life, the, the tests and the trials and the temptations just seem to be coming from every angle. And, and, and here they come one after another, or sometimes two at the same time. Just imagine what Job went through when in one day he's sitting there and he finds out there's a great storm went through. And uh, knocked the house down where his children were, and all his children were killed. And then the same day, uh, in fact, immediately, uh, another servant came and says, you know, th this tribe came through and they stole all your livestock. And, you know, just one thing after another happened, and his own health um, was his own health was attacked as he had boils, painful boils over his body. And just as one attack after another uh, friends, I'm not sure any of us could would be able to put up and pass the test like Job did. And sometimes we're critical of Job. We should not be critical of Job. He went through the, the very, the very stretching of his faith beyond what probably many of us could ever handle. But he's a great example of one who had victory through the Lord, uh, though tested in his faith. And he didn't have all the, the, the Old and New Testament like we do today to give us encouragement and hope and help as we go through that he had to go through it just trusting god but he could have that he could have that joy knowing that god's in control but sometimes we we, we are surrounded um fall in these temptations we're surrounded by these temptations and they're like the, the, the thief i mean the man that man walking traveling from jerusalem up in the mountains down to jericho down by the jordan river that man making that journey though it was considered a very dangerous journey because of the many th uh, robberies that were taking place uh, that was known unfortunately that man was not going there to be robbed that man was trying to avoid that and I'm, i imagine he went during the day when it's safer and not a, a twilight or dark you know, he went there but um, he wasn't looking to be robbed and surrounded by thieves and beaten, and he wasn't seeking out being robbed, and none of us should seek out trials. They come. They find us. They come as God permits them to come to make us stronger and better, and they will be diverse temptations. They will be diverse. I did that word means different, different of uh, different um quality of different extent of different time you know some temptations are very short-lived we could we could be struggling financially and see money lying there we know it belongs to someone else and we can be tempted to take it to meet our need but we know that's not pleasing to the lord we know that's that's stealing so that could be a very quick trial and temptation we also can have a uh, a diagnosis of a very serious disease that could be a very long term trial of our faith, and so they come at different extents. They come from different angles. One could be a one could be a struggle, a temptation in our mind. Another could be a very outward physical temptation or trial. These things happen. They are all diverse temptations. They will come, but we can count it joy. Why? What's going to be counted joy? Why can we have that proper attitude? Because we know God has permitted it for some reason and that we're going to talk about in a minute to make us stronger. He has an end goal. He knows where our weak areas are, and he's allowing that to strengthen us in those weak areas. And he also, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, knows our limits, knows how much we can handle before we can no longer withstand no longer grow through that and he will provide a way to escape when that happens so we can have that proper attitude of joy as we go through these trials and troubles 
that produce fruit. The produce fruit is found in verses three through four. That we know that that trial of our faith produces endurance. As we learn to say no, it makes us stronger so we can say no next time. As we, as we learn to say no, and God blesses us and gives us that peace and that encouragement in our hearts and meets our needs in other ways, then we're able to say no easier the next time. It builds that, that strength. It builds that endurance. It builds that, another word could be steadfastness. It builds that. Just like if you go into a test. Um, some of you have had a lot of education. Dr. Victor and I, we have our earned doctorates, and, and it takes a lot of years to do that. And, and as you learn to study and you learn to prepare for tests, uh, you know, as time went on, and even my academic prepare, preparation, I look forward to tests because I, I, I knew how to study for them, and I knew usually tests were at the end of a course. And so I look forward to taking a test and kind of finish up a class. I, I not dread them. In that way, you prepare for them because you know you it, it tests and evaluates you. I wanted to see if I was really picking up what it was teaching or and so forth. And it, so it produces that strength and that steadfastness over time. Because verse four reminds us that the God's goal is to make us complete. God's goal is, a, is to make us um whole. God's goal is to make us the words in the, in the New Testament are perfect and entire with no areas of weakness. Now, that's not always obtainable, not until heaven. But God's goal is to lead us that way because God uses us when we're mature and complete and entire. God can use us when there's not a weak area of our lives because let me remind you, we do, in addition to our flesh, which we'll talk about next week, verse 13 and following, in addition to our flesh, we do have an enemy, Satan and, and evil um, evil forces. And they, our enemy knows our weaknesses. And a good enemy, I mean an effective enemy, what I mean by that, will attack your weaknesses. A, a, a good enemy, an effective enemy, does not attack your strengths. So if we have an area of weakness in our lives, you can be sure that Satan and his forces will attack that area of weakness. Until God, by until we allow God through testing and trials and obedience to strengthen and fortify that area. So the produce fruit is that endurance and patience um, is is the new is the King James word patience or endurance or steadfastness and completeness that comes and maturity that comes through it all. So there is a produce fruit that comes. Thirdly, or letter C. God even provides help for us as we're going through it. He provides wisdom. And he says, if you don't understand what's going on, ask me to give you wisdom. And, and by, by the way, a lot of that wisdom, he's already answered to us for us in his word. And nothing will drive you to study God's word more than going through trials. That's the right response. As we're tried and troubled, we go through the we go to God's word to seek understanding, we to seek wisdom. So he says, if you like, if you lack wisdom, then ask, ask me, and go to His word and ask God. God, give me direction to Your word. And verses six to eight reminds us, and don't be, you know, don't be wishy washy, don't be uh, wavering. If, if you ask God, verse 5 says, if you ask him, he will answer. So get into the word and go to him in prayer and spend more time on your knees uh, in prayer and reading God's word. And he will direct you to the answers to your soul's needs as we go through these trials and troubles. But don't be double-minded. You know, that's, that's, that's something we struggle with. You know, we Go into this, well, then we say, well, God, are you really doing this? And God, why are you doing this? And we're, and we, we're going back, and we have to really relearn it again. And, and in America, where well, you don't learn something the first time, you have to go through it again and remedial education, and you don't pass uh, until you learn you learn that basic because you because so much of life uh, and vocation and academics build upon 
uh, the lower levels, you know, I, I'm a math guy. I taught, I teach math. I used to teach my kids math when we home educated them. I'm the, I was a math teacher and I realized that the things they learned in, in lower grades were the things they learned in lower grades, like addition, subtraction, division, um, uh, multiplication, things were built upon that. If you didn't understand those basics, it was hard to build algebra or calculus or anything on top of that. So I made sure we got to learn these foundational truths here and and understand those so we can build upon that. And so don't be double minded in that way. Trust God and go to his word and he gives us wisdom and he promises to give us wisdom and he's not going to upbraid us. He's not going to um, he's not going to. Um, you know, make not make fun of us, but he's not going to upbraid us or punish us for asking. Ask for wisdom. He will give it to us liberally, he says. But we have to ask and plead for him to give that direction. And then we have that mature understanding. What's the mature understanding? The mature understanding is that God will work through our circumstances where we are. If we find ourselves, um, verse nine says, a low degree. Uh, we find ourselves poor, um, you know, poor in life, poor in finances, and going through difficulties like that. He says we still, verse 9, should rejoice. We should rejoice. Not say, why, why me? Oh, God, why can't you bless? You know, this goes all against this whole, um, what we call in America, and I know it's in India as well, called prosperity gospel a false teaching that was present in the New Testament time as well. So it's not a new thing. And basically prosperity gospel says, if you're right with God, then everything's going to be great. If you're right with God, then you're not going to be sick. You know, you're going to drive a fancy car. You're going to have a lot of money, whatever else. And if you don't, if you're, if you find yourself sick and going to troubles, if you find yourself, your car is always breaking down if you're finding yourself having a hard time uh, living in a, in a, in, in a uh, comfortable uh, home, then obviously there's sin in your life. Well, that's not what the Bible teaches. That's what evangelists on TV often teach or what the prosperity gospel people teach. And, uh, and oftentimes our motivation is not the right motivation. The motivation is for more of your money. You know, sometimes they even say, you know, by a step of faith, give some seed money and, and send your money. You know, and really a lot of times, at least in America, and probably is true also in India, who they're taking advantage of, these movements, these religions, these preachers, if you want to call them preachers, they're taking advantage of the poor. And the poor get poor. Um, James here is saying, you know, if you find yourself struggling financially, still rejoice. Because God's going to exalt you. God's going to provide for you. God's going to teach you through this time because in the ultimately, whether rich or poor, we all go through trials. You know, who is that goes through diseases more rich or poor? Well, I mean, there's more poor people in the world. So it seems like more poor people get diseases, but no amount of money can keep you from getting a disease necessarily. Rich people get cancer and so do poor people, you know, uh, well, which, 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 um, which, um, okay, here's one that's really close. What keeps you from getting COVID, being rich or poor? I mean, well, sometimes you say, well, rich people can get more medicine, but COVID did not did not uh, discriminate among rich and poor. Um, all in all, it goes like that. So he's saying, you know, if you're low degree, verse nine, the key is learn contentment. Learn to be satisfied with what God provides. And I have found over life, sometimes sometimes the trial is in this area of finances. And when we learn to be good stewards of what God gives us, and this is really borne out by Luke 16, um, but when we learn to be good stewards of what gives us, God is then able to bless us with more finances. The truth is, and I've seen this time and time again as a pastor, some people are poor because they can't handle finances and what i've seen time and time again is people who say you know pastor pray for me i have a better paying job and pay for me i'll be able to buy the, buy this house or pay for me i'll be able to get this new car 
and and we pray together and and what happens is God does answer. They get they get that new job, they get paid twice as much money, and all of a sudden, their spiritual life, you know, it declines. They're not they're not in church as often. They don't need to fellowship with the believers. They're not reading their Bible. They're tempted in all types of area of sin uh, because now they have money to well, gamble or they have money to go and, and, and be involved in pleasures and, and their finances have become a temptation to them. So in other words, God and his grace keep some people from having money because they, God realizes that that would be an area of strong temptation for us. So there's a reason that, that we find ourselves sometimes in those financial conditions. It's not just because of what you know our family background is or where we live. It's because of the fact that God knows that money would ruin us. I've seen many Christians, professing Christians, who money has ruined. Um, so if you're in low degree, you find yourself in verse 9, um, if you find yourself in a poor degree, you know, poor condition of life, still rejoice. God can still will still meet your need. Verse 10, if you find yourself financially blessed, um, realize that God has God has blessed you and put you in that position with a stewardship also and a lot of accountability for that as well. But in the end, money, money will be gone. It's like that grass, verse 11 refers to is like the grass that withers away uh, over time. And so we got to understand that and realize that. And so we got, we got to work on this area of verse, um, verse 9 to them of contentment, being satisfied with what God has provided for us and our state where God has put, provided for us and be faithful in those areas to pass the test. And if, the, and if a poor person uh, struggles with finances and God gives you some blessings and you're faithful in using them, Luke 16 brings us out, then God usually blesses you with more. Think about the parable of the, the men with the talents. Uh, the man who got the five talents, invested it, used his talents for God and, and, uh, and doubled them. The man with the three used his talents for God, doubled them. The, the one man who had the one talent buried it. And uh, and when the, the king came back, he rewarded and called good and faithful servants to the ones who were faithful in the a large amount God gave, the, the middle amount God gave, and then he punished and cursed the one who who never who who hid his talent. So we had to learn to be contemplative and realize we're stewards uh in what God has given to us. And then lastly, uh, verse 12, and we'll, and we'll look at verse 12, and then we'll take our pause for the week. It says, blessed is the man that endureth those temptations. Okay, once again, that's that word. That's a neutral word that can refer to trials in life, testings in life. They can become temptations to sin, but sometimes they are temptations to sin, and we have to learn to say, no, I will not do what's wrong. I will not disobey God. I will not follow my flesh, but I will follow my Savior. And sometimes they're tests to to see whether or not we have, you know, how, how we're doing as far as um, our faith, the strength of our faith. And he gives a special blessing if we uh, if we pass the test, if we stand under it and do not give in and do not quit or do not become bitter. Blessed is the man who does that. He says, for when he is tried, and that's a different word in the Greek. When he is tried, and that deals with the word that actually deals with the idea of testing of, of metals, testing of coins. When he's tried and found to be pure or found to be, you know, found to be um, whole, at least, maybe not 100% pure, but whole, uh, he shall receive a crown of life. I mean, just think about it. God is, not only is God going to help us through it and give us wisdom and help us grow stronger through the trials and troubles of life, but God will also reward us. For passing the test, a crown of life, which the Lord has promised to them to love him. Isn't that a wonderful promise? So he's not only telling us about life, that there are going to be trials and troubles and tests that will come as just a natural part of life. But he says, but when you are faithful to me, I will reward you. I will reward you. And we'll pick it up next week there in verse 12 and, and be encouraged with that a little more. Before we go, though, I do want to give you some... Um, 
I want to give you some uh, homework for next week. All right, once again, for next week, I want you to read through the book of James seven times. Again, remember the, and we're not going to be doing this every week, but these first few weeks, I really want you to really saturate yourself in the book of James. And so if you did make it seven times this past week, then I'm encouraging you for sure to do it this week, one time a day. I did it seven times this past week, as, uh, as I asked you to do it as well, less than 15 minutes a day. So we're not talking about a lot of time commitment. But read through the book of James seven times this week. Don't wait until the day of. Don't wait until next Wednesday to read it. You put yourself under undue pressure. Um, but start reading through the book of James seven times and try to accomplish reading in one sitting if possible. And I did that all seven times. I read all five chapters at one time just to see it. Now, number two, this is what I'm asking you to do now. It adds to a little more. Part of your homework. Now that you've read through seven times, you read through seven more times. Look for 12 themes or areas of testing in James and write them down, okay? Um, I want you, as you're going through it, say, what are some areas that James is talking about in which he, in which God tries us or in which our flesh tries us and tempts us? What are some of these areas? And, and I pick out at least 12, and we're going to be looking at 12 this this. Um, this semester as we work through this like i said some of them will take two periods to work through some of them will be just one period to work through it will work, we'll work out but look for 12 themes and write these down and as you read through just ask the lord lord what are you trying to teach me through james um what what is james referring to and look for these areas and i'm not looking for sentences it may only be one word or two words but what are some of these things what are some of these themes uh, or areas of testing that God is is, is referring to here. And uh, look for those as you work through here. You're welcome to use your Greek and get in there as well, but just look for some themes. And, and I'm going to ask you next week to turn in what you found, um, to, let me, to let us know what you found there in these 12 themes. And then thirdly, I want you to memorize the next verse, James 1, 3. Okay, you already read... Do you remember verse, verse 2? My brother counted all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. Now I want you to move on to verse 3 as well. Review verse 2, but move on to verse 3 and learn what it says. Once again, a short verse. Knowing this, the trying your faith worketh patience. That word means endurance, steadfastness, the Greek word there. So memorize, uh, memorize these uh, verses as we continue to this verse as we continue to prepare next week. Okay? So I think that's... Uh, I think that will give you some work to do for the next week. Um, once again, I'm not having you do outside reading. You can do whatever you want to do. I really want you to saturate yourself with the book of James. So read through it another seven times. Look for these 12 themes and memorize verse 3 of chapter 1. Okay? So give some examples of the 12 themes. Just give one example so that we can just understand what actually we expect from it. Okay, I can I can do that. I, I can tell you that next week, Lord willing, we're going to move into the first test, which is found in verses um, verses nineteen through twenty five, and that is what here's here's a test question. What is my or something similar to this? What is my relationship to God's word? Okay, it's not just yes and no answers, but I'm I ask questions. Get us thinking, as I think James did. What is my relationship to God's word? And then that passage of scripture, verses 19 to 25, uh, tells us, is teaching us about the word of God, that we are to be hearers and doers of God's word. Then now we're not simply just to read God's word for biblical facts, but we are to let it penetrate into our lives and change us um, as you go through. So that's so that's one that's one of the 12 themes right there. Is the area of testing is my appreciation. My understanding, my obedience. Uh, I use the word, I think, relationship to God's word. Okay, so that be the, that's the first one we're looking at. Um, should get into start next next um, next Wednesday morning. Okay, so there are eleven others. The first one I see, at least, is you know about God's word. Um, what's my relationship to God's word? In fact, if you want to, what I what I have done is I made to help the run make it clear. I, I actually make up these 12 
uh, tests into like uh, questions on a test. That helps me in my mind. They can stay organized. And uh, when I preach it through week by week, I, you know, it, it's basically another question of the test of the areas of our testing. This is, doesn't cover every one specific test, but these are general tests. And the first one is, what is my relationship to God's word? You know, is it just a book? Is it just uh, something I go to from time to time? Do I use it like a dictionary? Um, you know, do I, you know, how do I use it? Is it, do I use it just like a, for Bible knowledge, like an encyclopedia where I can go look up uh, the names of people or it do, does God's word, as it says here in this passage, does God's word penetrate me to such a point where it changes me? And I become a, I don't want to just be a hearer of God's word, but I want to be a doer of God's word. And so that's the first, that, that's the first one. What is my relationship to God's word? See, so you got the first one. Go ahead and look for the uh, next 11, okay, to the rest of the book. All right. We'll see you next week. God bless you all. Let's see, let me see if I can see all of you here or many of you here, some of you here. All right. God bless you all. See you next week. Thank you.